Good evening, I'm Helga Jansen Dalby and welcome to Democracy in Action, the show where we talk about issues affecting you and your community. The Office of Health Standards in the 2016-2017 financial year says that only five out of 696 public health facilities managed to meet the 80% pass mark set by the Department of Health. The vast majority of people in South Africa, and that's around 52 million people, are reliant on the public health care system. For some, it's an ailing system, at its best, under-resourced, at its worst, severely dysfunctional. And yet, there are pockets of excellence and innovation, such as the first middle ear transplant performed by Professor Mashudu Sifaluro at the Steve Biko Academic Hospital in Pretoria. Tonight on Democracy in Action, we discuss the state of public health services in South Africa and we ask, what is the role of society and government in particular to provide efficient, dignified and accessible public health? We'll, when we return, we'll be discussing this with our in-studio panel. The state of South African public health care is a contentious issue and one that media and citizens on social media are especially vocal about. 2018 in particular saw State Hospital Grootiskeer in the news and going viral on social media more than once for reports of misdiagnosis and bad treatment by staff. In response to the complaints of misdiagnosis published in the Cape Argus in November 2018, Grootiskeer Director Dr. Bavar Patel said that misdiagnoses were highly unlikely at the hospital but added that there was a countrywide problem at health facilities that are unable to keep up with the demands of patients as patient loads increase while staff numbers remain the same. In June 2018, the public health system made headlines after the Office of Health Standards Compliance Annual Inspection Report was tabled in Parliament. The report evaluated 649 out of 3,816 healthcare establishments and found that 224 establishments were critically non-compliant. In the Western Cape, out of 59 establishments evaluated, 22 were non-compliant, 3 were critically non-compliant and 20 were conditionally compliant with serious concerns. In response to the report, Health Minister Arden Mozzoleri responded that while the healthcare system is distressed and going through very hard times, it is not on the verge of collapse, as media reports claimed. It is very true that the, and, and self-evident really, that the healthcare system is very distressed and going through very hard times. The pattern of disease and hence the demand of health care has grown so exponentially that the system finds itself extremely overloaded. For instance, if you go back 2004, South Africa had 400,000 people on ARVs. Today we have got 4.2 million. It increased 10 times. But this was not met by a concomitant increase in the number of staff or even the number of facilities and equipment. That doesn't happen really because it, the, 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 the increase of this tenfold increase happened within a very short space of time of uh, uh, that period, as I'm saying, of 10 years. So this has resulted in very long waiting times in most of the facilities, and of course the lowering of quality in others, in some of them. But as far as we know, this healthcare system still is still able to provide treatment to the largest number of HIV positive people globally. As I have already said, our HIV AIDS program is the biggest in the world at 4.2 million people. Our public health system is still able to treat all patients who suffer from TB. All 300,000 of them who are on treatment, and you are aware that in South Africa, TB is only treated in the public sector and nowhere else. 
we are still able in the public health care system to take care of 1.06 million women out of the total figure of 1.2 pregnant women. We have a biggest problem of human resources, which we cannot deny. It will be very foolish for us to deny it because after all, while Sub-Saharan Africa carries 80% and more of all infectious diseases in the world, it has got only 3% of human resources for health in the world. And South Africa is not exempted from that. Welcome back. You're watching Democracy in Action. With me in studio to discuss the state of public health in our society is Denver Roman, Provincial Secretary of DENOSA, the, let me get this right, the Democratic Nursing Organization of South Africa. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you. We're also joined by the Treatment Action Campaign's Vuyani Makoto, National Representative for People Living with HIV. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And then we're also joined by Dylan Oktober, who is the spokesperson for the Cape Mental Health. Thank you very much. And again, to remind you, we're talking the state of community and public health in our society. Um, Vuyani, let's start with you. Describe to us what is the state of public health at community level? How are people experiencing the service? Thank you very much for offering me this opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll, first and foremost, I must state it clearly that it is evident that the health is in, the state of health in South Africa is in crisis at the moment. Uh, why I'm saying that um, we have done a, a survey as TAC throughout the facilities in South Africa and that, that survey is indicating that people are being turned away from the facilities because there's a shortage of staff, because there's a shortage of medicines, because of other things. And it, that itself to me is an indication of that the system is in a, in a crisis. You go to areas like the rural areas of the Eastern Cape, rural areas of KZN, where there is not even ambulance services in those areas, and uh, people are dying day in, day out. That itself, to me, is an indication that it is the, the state of health in South Africa is in crisis. And you, you, you come to city areas where everybody is thinking that things are much better, but you, you, you will always find that people are sleeping in the floors in various hospitals, come to Kailicha District Hospital, which is always in the, in the, in the news for wrong reasons. That itself is an indication that the healthcare system in South Africa is in crisis, it needs to be fixed. So in, in a nutshell, so we, are in, we are in the state of a, 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 in a, in a state where a health system of this country can collapse at any stage if it, it attention is not given to it. Vuyan has given us a snapshot of what the lived experience is, but at the forefront of the delivery are the nurses. What is their experience? We know about lack of um, equipment, etc. But, but what is how are they experiencing delivery um, on the, um, uh, delivering a service on the brink of collapse? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting us. We really appreciate this. Uh, in the Western Cape, service delivery is not as bad as in other provinces, but it's still a challenge, as Vuyani said, because just because the Western Cape is a bit better than others doesn't make the system right. Now, the focus of, 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 of the Western Cape is on saving money. Now, if you want to save money, something is going to be compromised. So if you look at uh, quality assurance processes, then if you save on money, the benefit to the clients uh, will be compromised. Now, that's precisely what is happening in the Western Cape too. Because nurses need to work overtime because there's an insufficient staff. Sometimes they don't have resources like injections and stuff because uh, they call it I think CMD, or I can't come to the right word, for pharmacy services, those tablets and stuff aren't available. 
and also if the service is compromised by any other profession, then they expect the nurse to do it, like to, for porter services, for uh, administrative services, and any other service, then they expect, the, like information management, is a specialist field, then they expect nurses to do statistics. Then it takes them away from service delivery. He, may, he mentioned the issue about Kailicha, and it has become a challenge because people sleep on the floor, the waiting times is extensive for patients, so if the patients complain, the first person that they see would be a nurse. Now they get angry at the nurses for the system, but the management don't rectify mm. the system because the nurse is at the forefront and the nurse needs to explain. But she doesn't have the answers mm. many mm. times. So it's time management. And maybe the minister needs to take responsibility and make sure that people have the right resources mm. And, and I explained to somebody recently that they expect nurses to, nurses to see between 32 to 40 patients, which means you literally see a patient every five minutes. How much quality goes into seeing that patient, especially if you look at mental health patients mm -hmm. who need extensive assessment and extensive intervention, and especially if you look, I see he's got HIV somewhere written on him here, and these clients need extensive intervention mm. because mm. there's pre-counseling, there's post-counseling, and while the person got HIV, they need to see the family. How can you do that in five minutes? Exactly. They expect quality from people whilst they don't have enough people. And if I may mention it, this problem has started since 1994, not recently because Mandela indicated people are going to have free services, especially women's health. If you go back to that period, the staff did not increase concomitantly to the burden of disease, the migration of people from other countries to South Africa, the increase in, in, in the birth rate. So if more people are there, they necessarily will have more problems. I, I want to come to the Cape Mental Health because you spoke about um, the burden on nursing staff for the various sectors in the health, in health populations. Dylan, Cape Mental Health, a decades long um, mental health organization working in this space. Um, what is the experience if we, if we look at the, 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 the scenario sketched by Denver um, in terms of mental patients being able to access the support? Um, well, thank you, Helga, for having me on the show and providing this platform to have this important discussion. Um, where mental health is concerned and accessing um, public health systems, it's an extremely complex and sticky situation for some people living with mental health conditions. And I feel that the root cause of the problem is that, you know, government is not prioritizing mental health within the, the health sector, within it, within it all. And it's a lot of, of, of challenges and barriers around the, the concept of mental health. It's not being understood and, and digested to understand how to combat this in that sense. Um, and it can be like the, my, my fellow panelists have, have mentioned before, it's extremely extensive waiting hours for people who have complex conditions. And it's just, it's just not on. Mm. Um, and people are dealing with, with all kinds of life, life challenges and experiences in this regard. But it's been particularly um, difficult, especially f where mental health is concerned, because of accessing and also getting the right kind of treatment. Um, it's extremely impossible for, for, for nurses to see mental health patients and also provide a, a specialized comprehensive mm -hmm. care or intervention plan for them as well that they do need based on the workload that they have at, at various districts as well. So there's, there's a, a complex issue and chain of, of challenges that, that is just um, perpetuating the cycle. Mm. Um, Vuyani, both uh, Denver and Dylan spoke about long waiting periods and yet um, national health systems across the world, waiting is part of a national service. Mm. Um, and yet, uh, the, the Treatment Action Campaign is calling for a reduction in the waiting period. Mm. But this is life in a national service. Um, what is your response to All that? Right. 
Um, we are saying as treatment action campaign, they should know by any chance, we should not have a client who is going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and be in the queue in the clinic and goes back at a home at 4 o'clock. That should not happen. We are saying at least the minimum between one hour to three hours is, is, should be the minimum, right? We understand the burden that, that the, how the health care workers are faced mm -hmm. with in, 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 a, in a public health care facilities. However, we are also saying there are other amicable solutions that we can bring al 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 along. Because uh, the reason why I'm saying that, we've got nurses that are trained year out, year in and year out, but we do not absorb those nurses in the public health care system. Mm -hmm. They opt to, to, to go for, to, to a private health care system or they leave the country simply because of the working conditions are not mm -hmm. conducive in South Africa. Then that itself is, 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 is giving or is contributing to a more, the more burden that mm -hmm. we, are, we are sitting with. In, in, in healthcare in, 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 in the system. Can I just f focus on this one point, the drain, the, 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 the brain's drain within the public health sector. Denosa, Denver, how, what is the response from your side? Because you, you've painted the picture that the conditions um, as for workers, for health workers, is not optimal. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware that the brain drain is as profound as it was in the past, however, some nurses do go overseas and it's mainly for money because that drives people to go to wherever they want to be. And because the salary in the salaries in the Department of Health is much better than it was in the past. But then there's a high discrepancy between other people who did four year degrees and nurses that also did four-year degrees, and nurses who specialize in specific areas. So it looks like the department consider nurses as handmaidens, uh, which they did in the past. You must assist the doctor, you must be the maid of the doctor, and in this current environment of recognizing women's rights, we cannot still sit with that concept that uh, nurses must must be considered as handmaidens. Is that still prevalent in, in, in the system at our big district hospitals and our big provincial hospitals? Unfortunately, yes. And what, what does that point to? Is it about training? No, it is about, it's about uh, your, your social mindset and how you contextualize uh, uh, your perception of people. Because if you look at it, um, in the past, there was an ordinance that made a doctor the CEO of a hospital. He was a medical superintendent. What the, what the doctors did now was they created positions like a clinical uh, manager or medical manager. It's only doctors. If you look at the structure of the Department of Health, I'm talking about the Western Cape, the head of department is a medical doctor. The second in charge is a medical doctor. Other people that are in charge of clinical services are doctors. So I'm asking myself if you've got nurses with a doctoral degrees and master's degrees, what makes them less competent than those people Many times are just doctors. They completed their basic medical degrees. So you're saying that that is still the mindset that has to shift at an institutional level? No, there's, there's a purposeful process to ensure that nurses are excluded from management and management positions. And would you say that that is... That then gets that resentment, that lack of progress within your profession is translated perhaps into people leaving for greener pastures? I, I think yes, mm. that's one of the reasons. And many a time people don't leave, but that resentment sits there. Mm. My employer don't care because they are busy abolishing the uh, nursing um, chief nursing officer position in this province. Whereas in all the other provinces it's there and there was a mandate given nationally to have those positions open. So 
what's going on with the Department of Health in the Western Cape. That's their perception of nurses because they want to eradicate this thing that nurses are able to manage and nurses must report to a doctor because that's why they have clinical managers and medical managers so the nurse will stop below that level and she can't move forward. So if you have a clinical manager, let them look at clinical stuff. Mm. Why must they manage a district or sub-district? There are other people who can manage it. I, I want to bring the, 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 the discussion back to the Cape Mental Health as an example of a sector that has to traverse um, the system. Um, would, so you, would you mind if you just mentioned sure. something? Yes. I must, however, compliment the department on the employment equity plans in National the National department or provincial department? Provincial, because they are considering uh, the mental health issues in the employment equity and discrimination against people with mental health, and they are busy with plans mm. to consider how we deal with uh, people with mental health under the employment equity plan. So there are moves afoot, Dylan, to expand services broadly. But in your experience as Cape Mental Health, is there enough being done to capacitate um, clinical staff, um, nurses, health workers to deal with the issue of mental health? Um, I would have to kind of take into regard the, the, the state of mental health within South Africa as well. And we're looking at one in four people that are able to access um, mental health care services out of, let's say, a, a total percentage of 75% of people living with a mental health condition or disorder within South Africa. Um, we've made strides. I have to commend that and I have to say it out loud, but more can be done in this mm -hmm. sense. Um, we've, mo we've, we've moved away from the deinstitutionalization de of, of, of um, people living with mental health conditions, which is a great move because it's, it's no use having someone who is living with a mental health condition and just put, putting them away in a, 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 how can I say, psychiatric hospital. They are of no use to, to, to society as a whole where mm -hmm. they are stripped from their dignity and their rights. They're living with a mental health condition, but it doesn't mean that they are less human in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to leave anyone behind in this regard. So I think it comes back to the, uh, the, the, the purpose of prioritizing um, mental health as well which great strides are being made, but more needs to be done in this sense. And also um, facilitating community-based um, services. And I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great that we are empowering people living with mental health conditions as an organization to understand their rights and, and, and feel that there is a platform for them to be integrated with into society. But more needs to be done on a community-based level for them to ha receive that support from communities. And, and that also breaks down the, sti the walls of stigma in the sense of if my neighbor understands that I suffer from depression or anxiety, there, there's a sense of empathy as well. Can, can I just ask Vuyani now? So now we've sketched the picture, we're going to go national. Because both Danva and Dylan have sketched what the experience is and there seems to be some positives in the Western Cape. Is, are these positives replicated? Um, and what do you think are the reasons why in the Western Cape it seems to be working? Um, but if we go to the Eastern Cape, um, mothers in, in childbirth are dying in, in the 21st century. All right. Um, looking at the conditions or the, 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 the history of Eastern Cape, you'll, 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 you'll understand as to why Western Cape is better than the Eastern Cape in terms of, doing, of rendering these services. In Eastern Cape, you, 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 for an example, a depot is in Port Elizabeth. Tell me, a person who is supposed to access medicine from Lusigisigi area, how is that person going to be able to get his medication? So in Western Cape, we've got, uh, we, we, we know it's not scattered. Western Cape is not scattered. However, I want, to, I want to point it out as well, that Western Cape is not as clear, I mean as clean as it is presented in most cases. Mm -hmm. A typical example, as we speak in Hermanas, there is a case that we are dealing with as TAC of the patients that were involved in a car accident two weeks back but still they are in Hermanas Hospital, though the conditions are not conducive for them to be in Hermanas Hospital. They were supposed to be transferred to Vustel Hospital, for, which is a primary health care, which has got all the resources that they require. 
But as, as I'm talking to you now, one of those patients is now waiting at home uh, because the, 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 there's no beds available in Vusta. There is no ambulance that is going to take them to Vusta. And again, they cannot keep him in hospital because they also need a bed the for bed. somebody uh, so for somebody else. Viana, we're going to come back one. to this conversation about the, 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 the disjuncture between services um, interprovincially. I know you then, but we're going to go to a break, and when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation. Welcome back. You're watching Democracy in Action. And before the break, we saw the conditions once again. Um, but we also spoke about, Buyani, you were describing the discrepancies, the disjuncture within mm. services mm. within a province. There are so many. Mm. There are so many. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, the, the issue of Hermanas, then again, there's an the, 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 the area called Kainmond, which is 31 kilometers away from Hermanas. It is a feeder to Hermanas. They only got a day service there, mm. a day clinic, mm. which opens between four and uh, I mean between seven in the morning and four in the in the afternoon. What happens on on a Friday av afternoon when when someone gets sick, and what happens during the, the course of the week when, the, when in the evenings when someone wants to deliver a baby, that person is, has to wait for an ambulance that is going to come from Hermanas, drives 31 kilometers from Hermanas to Glenmont and back to Hermanas you know, which is 62 kilometers. Anything is possible mm. that may happen in between. So, so the, 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 in the reality of the matter is we've got services that, uh, the, I mean, the, 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 the blink picture that has been painted is not exactly what is happening in the ground. Denver, you had a comment about the, the discrepancy and that the geographical distances between districts and the way that in which districts are also delineated. No? Yeah, I, th I think first of all, I'd like to just comment on the um, disjuncture between the rich and the poor. If you've got money, you go to a private hospital. All the money is absorbed by the private hospitals. Public hospital doesn't have such a lot of funding, and we hope through the NHI we're going to improve that. Whether it's going to happen, God only knows, and how long the NHI is going to be taken. Uh, the pilot that is happening in the Eden district, how long that is going to take and when they start rolling it out. Mm. But let me come back to the issue that uh, Vujani raised, is that a person from Hermanus must travel to Worcester instead of Helderberg, which is in Somerset, or Somerset West. Now, Worcester is how far away from Hermanus, whereas the person can go to uh, Helderberg Hospital, which is in Somerset West. So just explain to us, is this part of the way in which um, the province is divided, and therefore if my address is X Hermanus, I can only go there? Or is this just people who feel more comfortable? No, it's about uh, the referral lines. Mm. If I'm mm. from Hermanus, I fall under Bulan Overberg, I must go to that regional hospital. But it doesn't make logical sense because the nearest hospital to Hermanus is just over the mountain. So let's, let's bring in the mental health aspect as a population that requires um, service, chronic service. Is, is this the kind of experience that even your mental health patients may have in terms of accessing the chronic medication? If they live here, they have to go there and spend extra resources to get there when there is a facility 20 minutes away, for example. Um, I think it, it sprawls across the entire mm. mental health sector in this mm. sense, um, where you are basically, you are cornered into one specific district and that be where you need to get your needs or whether it's meds or, or services mm, from. Mm. Um, and it's especially um, 
extremely, how can I say, difficult for some of the, 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 the people that make use of our service, and we call them service users, because they only have a disability grant. And in some cases or households, you know, uh, they need to support a family or, or buy food as well. So it, it makes it difficult. Even um, our organization that has a day program for people uh, living with mental health conditions to train and upskill them to mm -hmm. reintegrate back into the work environment, it's extremely difficult for them to also attend um, our services as well because they need to make use of the disability grant to, to travel in and out um, because we don't have facilities where we can house them. Um, so a question then is the facilities that you're talking about, and I'm assuming these would be um, transitional homes or safe houses or independent living. Is Vuyani, is the state, and I'm talking now from a budgetary perspective, is the state prepared to expand those kinds of services, particularly if Cape Mental Health is wanting to um, foster a notion of reintegration into communities? Look, we, we, we are saying the state has to provide a budget for that. Mm. And I can assure you that the state has a budget for that. But looking at the, the budget, where the, where the chunk of, big chunk of budget goes to, instead of going to the infrastructure or the salaries of the healthcare workers, 60% of the budget in the department goes to the negligence, issues of negligence. Meaning, a, a typical example, a nurse or a doctor has forgotten to take out a scissor from uh, uh, the, the, the client that was actually mm. um, in the cesarean session, I mean, delivering a baby mm. through cesarean session. That itself, and, and, and but that particular client will definitely take the state to court, you know, and then do we have to pay the... the, the so the, we've the, got the costs. money. We've got money, but, but it goes towards the wrong direction. So you know, a, 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 a typical example, I can bring uh, the issue of life as a many, uh, which is a popular case. Everyone knows about it. There was no, there was no way that government cannot prevent the life of a city many that has happened, but simply because we've got people who are negligent time and again, be it the MEC. I, will, I want to come back to Western Cape in particular. So in the, in the case uh, that I made mention of earlier, one of the people from Emanas, I found the MEC. I sent her a WhatsApp. Do you know what? Surprisingly enough. Exactly the response that I got was exactly what you were, you were just saying, my colleague, to say the, 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 the Hermanas Hospital doesn't necessarily fall under a jurisdiction of a Cape Metro, and therefore the referrals has to be done uh, through to Ipoland. So basically bureaucracy is putting people's lives at, at risk. At risk. Absolutely. I want to just come back to the issue of the re-diverting of the budget to issues of negligence, Denosa. Denver, what is the response around that and what is the NOSA doing to inculcate a greater sense of purpose and a greater sense of responsibility in its members within the clinical space? Look, let me first, if you don't mind, go back sure. to that mental health issue. Go ahead. The idea was to devolve service delivery from the big mental health institutions to up to primary health care level. Like, I'm not going to name the hospital, but I went to one of the hospitals to assist a member. But the area where the patient, mental health patients should be kept is now a storeroom. So if you have a patient that's mentally ill and need to be restrained, there's, there's, there's no place for that person to be restrained because many a time the person cannot be strained, restrained uh, chemically they also need to be restrained physically and kept separate from other patients. And it's almost like a cell room. And the idea is not to make a person a prisoner. To come back to the issue of how do we deal with the, with the disjunctures, mm. it's difficult for the nurse on floor level to say no, let us rather send the person to Elderberg Hospital than to Worcester because the guidelines indicate that the person must, must, must go to the regional hospital, uh, the referral guidelines. So you have to send the person to Worcester. And it's, it's beyond my imagination how people can perpetuate this thing that the person must go to Worcester, whereas Elderberg Hospital is just over the, over the hill. 
And, and I think a lot of nurses try and limit and, and consider how money is mm -hmm. being spent, but you can only go so far. Absolutely. Because many a time uh, the, 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 availab uh, the budget availability doesn't rest in their hands. Mm -hmm. It further up. And the department constantly say we don't have money, which is a reality because health care has become mm. expensive. Mm. And, but what they do is that they will say to the nurse that she must go and work overtime, then they pay the nurse six, seven months down the line because the, the processes that they follow and the availability of money hampers the payout to the person, then the nurse would say, I'm not going to work overtime. I'll go to Dubai. Yeah, and, <laughs> and if they decide I'm not going to work overtime, then they're being disciplined for being mm -hmm. insubordinate or gross insubordination. Mm -hmm. Like the workload of the nurses has become so much that I know of one of the nurses who's been cited for misconduct and found guilty whether she was busy doing the in script, the writing in the notes of a patient, another person came and said to the nurse, look, my father isn't, doesn't look right outside. She asked the enrolled nurse, you get professional nurses, enrolled nurse, and enrolled nursing assistant. So she asked the enrolled nurse could, to go and do the observations and check mm, on the patient mm. while she's busy. And the road nurse came back and said the patient is fine. She'd be found guilty because she didn't go. They said she's supposed to go. And why didn't she go and all of that stuff. And if, if that is how the department treats the nurses, then I wouldn't know where to, to, to take or, or, or leave because now I leave the notes of yeah. this person that gave birth and I go to the client that's outside it wasn't necessarily referred to me. That person was referred somewhere else. Now I must go to look, go and see that client. So I must be all over the show. So it's a lot of responsibility on nurses to be not only the deliverer of the services, but also to have specifics and spe specialize. The issue you were raising earlier that suddenly you have to be an administrator. Yeah, and you run around like headless chickens. Exactly. Because I, I don't know where to take. If I leave here and I go there, I might be charged for that. But if I go, uh, if I do this and don't attend there, I'm going to be charged for that too. So how much do I juggle? Exactly. So I want us to now talk about the government pathways. And Denver, you spoke earlier about the National Health Insurance. It's a, it, it was a big campaign. It was a big excitement point for Yanni. Um, what is, what is it and what is tax position on the efficacy of a national health insurance? And we'll get the nurse's view on that as well. Okay. Thank you very much once again. Um, on the, the, the view of UTEC on this particular regard, uh, we are in support of ENHI because we, we, we're kind of seeing that it will bring uh, some sort of solutions to the problems, but not necessarily in all the problems that we're faced with. We, we, we were, we're raising, we have raised a number of issues or a number of concerns as TAC yeah. around the implementation of ENHI. We are saying now, in as much as we are waiting, I mean, we, we are excited about the NHI, but also provide us with the findings of the pilot, from the pilot's districts. A typical example, we do, we've got Eden District, uh, which is a pilot site. But still today, we do not have a, a, a first-hand information mm. as to mm. what is it, how did it function, what was there, and how did it work, and what was not there when, before NHI, you know. And again, if you look at the, the, the survey that was done by the, by the clinical norms and standards in, in terms of meeting the criteria, we, uh, about 696, yes, ne? 696. 696 uh, facilities were surveyed, and only five qualified. So if we are saying we're going to roll out NHI, mm. are, are these 595, I mean 695, uh, 691 ready? To, to, to be the NHI uh, suppliers, you know, to provide the say NHI mm -hmm. that is, is, is services that the NHI will definitely mm -hmm. provide. The answer to that is no, because we do not have the, 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 the report. And what else we were saying as TAC? What will happen to those clinics that were not part of the saving? Are we going to leave them out mm -hmm. and uh, to collapse? 
the, those are the concerns that we are having as TAC. Mm -hmm. A typical example, a clinic in, 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 in rural areas of East NKB, a Willow Vale, for an example, a Fort Malan, where a, a clinic was a four-bedroom house of someone. That clinic automatically doesn't qualify to, to, to roll out mm. the NHI the program. Then what are we going to say to that particular community that solemnly dependent on that particular uh, facility? I'm, I'm going to come to, to, to the mental health aspect of, 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 of a national service in terms of accents. But um, Danver, would you say, um, because you're painting a picture, Vuyani, of the greater requirements for rollout, doesn't the NHI also provide an opportunity in terms of labor to bring more health workers into a national system, for example, your community health workers? Uh, I think that's a perception and that's a principle and whether it's going to be implemented like that. We need to see, I'd like to support Vuyani on that. I think maybe it's time that tech and the NOSA and the unions need to work together than working separately. Absolutely. Because the more we separate, the more they create divisions. But basically with the NHI, the, the, the principle we support as the NOSA. And then in other countries, they call it universal health care. Mm. So we support the principle. Mm. But how it was roll out, rolled out in the Eden district and other pilot sites, we, we didn't get feedback yet. Mm. Because basically the money should go to a central fund for, uh, for a, a core service, health service. And if you want any other services except those core services, you must take gap cover or whatever cover for anything else. Yes. Like if you want, uh, like, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, replacing your heart or whatever. Transplants. Trans heart mm. transplants, yeah. Uh, that's not part of that package. If you want a heart transplant, then basically you need to be able to take out gap cover or anything else. But the core funds will go to that particular central fund and everything will be paid from there. But we need to ask private uh, service providers like Nikki, MediClinic and all those places, how happy are they going to be because their money must now also be paid mm -hmm. out of the central fund. Yeah. Are they going to be comfortable with it? And they the people that are digging the hills in terms of this universal health coverage. And so the point that you make, Denver, about the union movement and civil society organizations like TAC and even the Cape Mental Health working together to make sure that the centrality of the fund remains in state hands and that private providers are not um, foregrounded, right? I want to just bring um, Cape Mental Health, um, Dylan, into the conversation around the national health insurance and what this could potentially mean for organizations such as yourselves, because let's face it, you have been standing in the gap um, for mental health care provision for many, many years. Um, I'd have to echo Vuyani's sentiments and, and, and say that it's going to be a great relief in mm -hmm. terms of um, relieving some pressure, but it's not going to touch on every every point in that sense. Um, so we are in, we are in support of, of NHI, but um, we we there's there's no real tangible basis mm -hmm. to kind of evaluate whether it's working or not, especially when we consider the mm -hmm. the rollout in Eden Karoo. So we we it's it's almost like being left in limbo at this mm -hmm. stage. Um, we obviously support the prospects of, of NHI, but there is no real um, connection to mm. see how we can, can support it in that sense. It's still kind of a mystery that's behind a veil, if you like. Precisely, yeah, yes. yeah. I'm going to ask a final question, but before I do, during the break, Dan, where you made an offer to a uh, treatment <laughs> action campaign precisely around the Irmanis thing, and I want to call you out on it and ask you to repeat the offer to the treatment action campaign as they support their members um, and patients down in the Irmanis um, area. Look, the NOSA cares, and if you look at our motto, it says the NOSA cares. And we don't just care about nurses, we care about the community. We've got three leagues. The one league is a union league which is important, mm. but the most important league is our professional league. Mm. And the other league is a community league where we, we, we ad advocate on behalf of the community. 
Although some doctors get cheesed off if we advocate on behalf of the community because we come out strongly. I what have to I ask said, you, what is the What, is what the I said <laughs> to, to Vujani was that if he's got challenges at a particular hospital, then we need to work together. Absolutely. So that I can contact our member who's representing the Danosa members there and say, look, this is what tax is. Uh, and what's your experience? Why is it happening? Why can't you do something? Because we do that. I hope that TAC is going to take Denosa up on that uh, yeah, opportunity can, to can work attack, together. Can attack that opportunity. So uh, let, let me just ask as a final question. Thank you for that, Denver. Denver, what, what is your advice to communities to help support greater access? How can communities get involved? All right. One. In 20 seconds. <laughs> first and foremost, be form part of the hospital boards and clinic boards. That is the solution, mm. because with, uh, there's nothing for us without us. That is mm. the, the total solution. And again, the, 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 you must literate, uh, you must have e educational campaigns mm. for your society to, to understand their roles and responsibilities and their rights. Mm. Because if you look at the issue of e health, it's a, it's a constitutional right which is enshrined mm. on the Bill of Rights, Chapter 2, Section 27. And again, as, as, as I conclude, it is important, very important to understand that Healthcare workers, yes, in as much as they are having a burden, but their attitudes are actually mm. not uncalled for. Yeah. Um, Dylan, your last word on how communities can get involved to create greater access and to also challenge for greater access? Um, I think this is one of the, the, the pivotal areas in, in the work that we do in, in the sense of because it's extremely community-based, we, we encourage communities to be where mental health is concerned, mm -hmm. open-minded and, and, and extremely inclusive in this sense, mm -hmm. to understand, to educate themselves, um, to the up in, and especially in the upskilling of community health workers mm -hmm. as well, I think could be a bridge in, in casting a wider net and, and working within networks. Yes. Where we don't operate in silos, but we, we, we work together on because we have one goal and one issue we want to tackle together. I want to say thank you to our guests, Danva Roman from Denosa, Vujani Mokato from Treatment Action Campaign, and Dylan October from the Cape Mental Health. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening, and thank you to you at home for watching Democracy in Action. From me, Helga, and the crew here at Cape Town TV. Till next time. <laughs>